Thank you, David Mokaduka. That was very, very successful fireside chat. I think you'll agree. Um, so as the final event in our program today, I'm very pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker in the conference. Um, the Academy is very pleased to be able to welcome uh, Wanjiru Kamal Rutenberg, who is the director of the AWARD program. And AWARD stands for African Women in Agriculture, Agriculture Research and Development. And Wanjiru has generated a, a, an international reputation for her efforts um, to address underrepresentation of women in leadership positions in Africa and to create opportunities for women from disadvantaged backgrounds. And her work for award has a similarly gendered focus, supporting agricultural scientists to strengthen their ability to deliver gender responsive agricultural uh, innovation for development in Africa. Issues of gender and equity, as we all know, has been a consistent feature of ANH Academy activity, a feature of both our learning labs every year and conference sessions which are dedicated to gender and equity issues. So this is a very important dimension of what we do, and I think we're very privileged to have Wanjiru um, deliver a keynote address for us this afternoon. Wanjiru. Ah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm a little nervous. Um, but I'm really excited to be here and absolutely honored for this opportunity. Uh, as I was getting ready for, for this speech, I, I, I have in mind two speeches that I wanted to give, or at least two conversations that I wanted to have with each other. I only have 20 minutes, uh, so that, that's unlikely to happen, I think, for everyone's benefit. Um, but, so, but what I'm going to try and do is start with one and see if I finish quickly, and then we can get into a second conversation. The first conversation I want to have is to share some of the experiences and learnings that we have had as a ward over the last decade plus, working on increasing the diversity of researchers and building the capacity and the pipelines for researchers, uh, especially on the African continent. And then the second conversation is perhaps a more personal conversation um, with uh, some of us in the room or some of you in the room who are perhaps earlier on in your career and um, talking about what those journeys might look like, what, what those journeys look like and feel like, and how we can do a better job of supporting early career researchers, make those personal decisions to stay in science. So let's get started. Um, this is a piece about AWARD and the work that we've been doing. AWARD was created for one purpose, um, which is to uh, address a leaky, oh, that didn't work, um, to address a leaky pipeline of leadership, of women's leadership for agricultural research. The graph in front of you um, is work that we did together with um, with IFPRI's ASTI project, looking at the state and, and the, the state and career development of women in agricultural research across a continent. And what you see is indeed a leaky pipeline where even though we're not starting off at 50% uh, of entering students into agricultural research as women, we're starting off at 30, 34%, we're losing those few who even start the journey. So that by the time we get to leadership and, and decision making, uh, deciding, setting priorities and allocating resources, we're down to 17% of those people being women. And that's a huge problem. So what was created to ask the, asking the question, can we empower African women scientists enough so that they remain in science and thrive and do well in, in agricultural research? Um, and that, that um, data we collected in 2008, which was right at the beginning, towards the beginning end of award. We've been, continued to work with ASTI and uh, I just want to share a quick snapshot of what we've been uh, finding out is happening across the ecosystem uh, on the continent. This is some 2014 data. We will be releasing 2016 data uh, later on this year. Um, and what, what, this sh what, what I think is striking about this, this graph is the gap in the, and this is women uh, as a percentage of all researchers, agricultural 
cultural researchers in these countries. And what is striking to me is the gap that we have between Anglophone and Francophone Africa that remains something that, will st that still needs to be addressed. Um, and and this, is, this is a conversation we continue having. But, um, there's some good news also, which is trends are indicating upward. When you compare uh, 2008 to 2014, almost every single country has increased its percentage of women in uh, of women researchers. So. Um, that, and again, this is uh, all work we've been doing with uh, ASTI from uh, colleagues at IFPRI. Um, so that gets us started looking at the, the big picture of uh, the state or, or where women are in agricultural research on the continent. What has the award been doing to help uh, address and hopefully contributing to these upward trends? Um, over the last 12 years, AWARD has run a fellowship, um, a fellowship program, and this is a two-year career development fellowship. It is non-residential, and it has focused and continues to focus on three critical elements. The first is advancing women's science skills. It is so important that women show up at decision-making not as tokens, but as good scientists, that they show up and have access to that decision-making table because they are the best scientists um, and deserve a spot at that table. And so make, and we also know that there are systemic barriers to women having access to skill building so that they can become the best scientists possible. And so award works to address that and I'll share a little bit of what we do. Um, there's a piece that we do around developing leadership capacity. And thirdly, there's a piece that we do around fostering mentoring relationships. That that's really important to the work that we're doing. Um, award accepts applications into the fellowship program from women scientists at the bachelor's, master's, and at the doc doctoral levels. This is really important because there's wide disparity in, um, in capacities across a continent. If you go to Nigeria, it is not difficult to find hundreds of women holding PhDs in agricultural research. If you go to a place like Mozambique, you're going to be struggling to find, um, to find Doctoral, uh, doctorates, people with doctoral training. And so it's important for us as a ward looking and being a pan-African organization to make sure that we're finding the scientists where they are and helping them rise to the next level. Um, now, let me talk a little bit about what we're doing with science, and I'm not going to dwell on this as much because I think there's a lot happening within this community, strengthening science skills. The learning labs are amazing, and so I think there's already tremendous momentum in terms of building research skills within this community. I do want to spend a bit of time talking about what we're doing with leadership skills and what we're doing with mentoring that perhaps might be useful uh, to this community. Some of what is, has been important for us as a ward is increasing Africans with visi women's visibility and networking. And this has meant for us sponsoring our fellows to access membership. Uh, into international professional bodies. And this also means for us negotiating preferred rates to some of these professional bodies so that we can have bulk membership of African women scientists. This is just, and this is politically probably a minefield because for every one logo that I have here, there are 20 others that are not here and I cannot tell you why we picked some and not others, so please. Um, be kind. Um, another thing that we do is to build partner, um, build global partnerships that allow us to place our fellows, African women scientists, in some of the world's leading research labs for research learning placements of anywhere between two weeks to nine months. And this is where, for example, one of our fellows who's working, let's say we have a fellow who uh, was working on bio, continues to work on bioinformatics, who had an opportunity to travel to the US and work at DuPont Pioneer in their labs, strength learning the tools there and strengthening her 
her skills on bioinformatics, and she's now an incredible resource. She happens to work at ACRISAT, and she's an incredible resource for that organization uh, with those skills. And so building re relationships with some of the world's leading labs, including CG centers and research, uh, CG research centers, to, to then be able to, to foster uh, to build those technical science skills is an important component. Um, something I do want to dwell a little bit on when it comes to what award is doing is our mentoring program. Um, and here what we do is, in the first year of the award fellowship, each fellow is paired up with a mentor. This is a senior scientist, and I will say 45% of our mentors are men, so mentoring is not limited to women only. This is an important way to engage senior male scientists in sharing their wisdom and being advocates and, and, and uh, champions and sponsors of emerging women scientists. So in the first year, each fellow is paired with a male scientist, with a senior scientist who serves as a mentor. In the second year of the fellowship, each fellow identifies and serves as a mentor to an emerging, a junior scientist. And what we then have done with that model is create um, investments and mentoring relationships that are three generations deep. Um, in, and you can imagine what that then means in an institution, for example, where you're able to unlock the wisdom of an older generation towards the benefit of two generations of scientists who are coming up. Um, I also want to share a bit of what we're doing around our leadership training. And here we are very clear and very intentional that leadership is a skill that is built. Yes, there's innate leadership qualities, but leadership is a craft to be nurtured, to be exercised, to be practiced. And here we support African women scientists to build their own leadership skills. We recognize that often graduate education doesn't focus on what is called soft skills, and yet these skills are critical when it comes to what it takes to raise money for your research, to lead research teams, to build collaborations and networks for researchers. So some of the things that we focus on, negotiation skills, managing conflict, time management, public speaking, sustaining team performance, and building alliances, these are all what people tend to call soft skills. But if you have ever worked under a supervisor who didn't have any of those skills or all of those skills, then you really know what suffering is. Um, just a quick picture of what we've accomplished in the decade that we've been doing. Uh, some more, about, about 1,500 scientists have benefited from our work uh, from 23 countries, most of those in Africa. You will notice that Bangladesh, Spain, Fiji are some of the countries that we've engaged, where we've had fellows from. And what we did with that is approach the CG and invite directors general to buy into the award fellowship by sponsoring their own scientists into the fellowship. And that is a model that we continue adapting and adopting um, and encouraging others to adopt. And so um, maybe this is too shameless of a pitch, but if this community would want to sponsor or work with us to adopt some of the model, the fellowship model, towards building the careers of these scientists, that could be a really interesting conversation. Yes, we are African women in agricultural research and development. Our mandate and priority remains the African continent, but we're also recognizing that these are ecosystems that, and what happens, for example, the conversations that, happen, that are happening here around nutrition in Asia are very much linked to conversations that are happening on the African continent around the same topic. Um, all of our work is underpinned by, one, uh, by a theoretical framework that we developed and adapted from um, a lot of it informed by Naila Kabir's work. In the track that was on empowerment, uh, a lot of the, I was hearing a lot of language that was really familiar to me. Um, we love acronyms, so I, I'm a particular, uh, particularly fond of the African Women in Science Empowerment model, uh, awesome. 
the five components of awesome are, one, needing to understand the way that leadership growth starts with empowerment from within. These are five dimensions of empowerment that award looks at and measures. First is empower from within, where we're working on helping women increase their inner strength, self-confidence, and motivation to pursue a higher vision for herself and her career. After that, we find comes power to do. And here we're focused on increased capabilities and opportunities to accomplish and achieve professional autonomy. Uh, third is power over, and this is overcoming resource and power constraints to grow in influence. Here you can think a lot about being able to raise research funding. Um, we also have two other uh, components of empowerment that have been interesting and surprising for us as we've been uh, looking at our work. Power with, and this is the ability to initiate and lead collaborations to make contributions to agricultural science for the greater good. This is not often a dimension that people talk about with empowerment, and I know that even in the nutrition field, there's conversations about how do we measure this, how do we start to understand uh, power, shared power and collaborative power. Um, and then finally, the power to empower, which emerged, and, and this, this dimension of empowerment em was not one that was designed in our framework in the beginning. It emerged as we were reviewing the data over time. But here, looking at it, we found that we were creating motivated champions who were inspiring others and who were promoting gender responsive agricultural research. We're still working to understand that dimension of empowerment and what it means. And so I think there's interesting conversations to be had with those of you who are looking at empowerment uh, and dimensions of empowerment within the nutrition work uh, to, to, to how we could have interesting cross-fertilizing conversations. And finally, I want to share um, just really quickly some of what we're finding uh, that has been surprising to us. It appears that power from within and power to do need to occur in a woman scientist first before she can then have power over resources. And then finally, that power with and power to um, empower seem to emerge, t take the longest to emerge and to develop. And so that's been an interesting, um, it seems there's a teleology, if you will, of how these powers emerge. That has been surprising, and we're still trying to understand what that's about. And I, again, you, I think we could have really interesting cross-fertilizing conversations with those of you who are working within the empowerment models in your own work about whether you're finding the emp empowerment to look differently and to have different phases. Um, so what? Um, and, and I ask this in, in concluding. I think that as, as I was thinking about what do I want to leave you with, I, I have one question that I want to leave this community with is, uh, and that question is, beyond the technical skills that it is clear to me you're doing such a good job of building, how might this community also invest in the mentoring and leadership components of the next generation of researchers? Are you thinking about leadership? Are you thinking about mentoring? Are you thinking about those soft skills? Because again, as I said, to know misery is to, know, to, 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 to work under a leader who doesn't have those leadership skills. And surely we don't want to invest in really building really good technical experts who are going to not inspire the generation after them to come into this field of, of work. Um, I, we are also, as a ward, reflecting on a couple of questions. Um, and these may or may not be relevant to you in this community, um, but they are certainly keeping me up at night. The first question is, um, do award fellowships to African women scientists translate into systemic transformation of African agricultural research? Um, perhaps a better way of asking that question is, how can we as a ward better align our work to the priorities of African research institutions and, strength, in strength, and strengthen their capacity to de deliver on their already existing mandates? Um, what I'm pointing to here is 
a tension that can sometimes exist between individual capacity building and institutional strengthening, where if you're not careful, efforts at individual capacity building can be seen to work not in alignment with the needs and, and, and priorities of a research institution. And so we've, we have found that to be a tension that we needed to navigate within their award fellowship work. Um, and I wonder if that is a tension that might be emerging as you continue with fellowship programs and building technical skills of these individuals. How are you thinking about the institutional context within which these early career scientists are then going back into work? Some of how we are trying to solve this problem, and this is my last slide, is uh, with a new strategy that is really looking at three, and I, I won't go into detail with this. Um, this is readily available on our website. Um, we're now looking at a, a, a three-legged stool, if you will, um, with one leg being a continued focus on individual scientists and could, um, where we want to work with capable, uh, towards having capable, confident, and in influential African women scientists lead critical advances and innovations in agricultural research and development. A second leg to that stool is institutions, where we're working to have African agricultural research institutions and agribusinesses, and this is important to us as well, prioritize and embrace gender responsiveness in both policy and practice. And the final leg is looking at the broader enabling environment where we're working towards having gender responsiveness as a norm that's embedded in the culture and practice of the African uh, innovation, agricultural innovation landscape. Um, and so that, and that realization that there are three interconnected parts that we need to pay attention to has come out of um, is our way of dealing with that, what we found to be a tension between investing in capacity, individual capacity strengthening, sometimes being seen as not aligned or perhaps even antithetical to institutional uh, priorities. I'm gonna stop there with a more kind of perhaps geeky part of this. Um, and how much time do I have? Uh, do I have a couple of more minutes? Oh, five more minutes, oh good. Um, I wanted to share three quick stories to illustrate a point that we're trying to get at with our data and trying to figure out how to, that we're trying to figure out how to get at with, with our data, in, in our data and through our research methods. Um, I was thinking a lot about what was, I, what was my experience like at the very beginning of, of my career. And now, I, some of you may be looking at me like, you are early career, and indeed, um, I will admit that I think the journey ahead of me is still longer than the journey that I've already walked, and so it's dubious whether I'm early career or not. But earlier in my career, I was a graduate student, and I remember I wanted to share two quick stories, um, two, two, two things that happened to me, two experiences that I had in my first week of graduate school. Here I was at the University of Minnesota. Um, I'll be honest, I am not an agricultural nutrition expert. I am um, perhaps should be ashamed to say I'm a political scientist. Um, it's a checkered past, I will admit. Um, so here I was, first week of graduate school, University of Minnesota Political Science Department. I am, of course, the only black woman, forget the only African. Um, and one of the things that happened uh, in graduate school is, for the first time in my life, professors thought it was okay to assign a book a week, and all of them did that. And so if you were taking four classes, you had to finish four books every week. And none of them gave a break in the next week. So it was four books a week, every week, for the duration of the semester. Um, I don't know about you guys, but that's really unrealistic for me. But um, so I guess graduate school is a great training in winging it or suddenly faking it. Um, anyway, um, this reading load was incredibly heavy. And in the first week, as we all do, I thought I had to read everything all the time. Um, 
and I tried to, so here I am, probably about a Wednesday or first week of classes. The Department of Political Science is in the 12th floor of the skyscraper, right off on the, on the banks of the Mississippi River in Minneapolis. It's about 9, 10 p.m., red-eyed. I've been trying to, to finish this book. Um, probably go about halfway through before giving up. Um, it's late in the evening and I put on my coat, I'm gonna get in the elevator and go back to my apartment. And as I, um, the elevator comes, opens, there's one of my professors uh, already in the elevator. I walk in, um, you know, press a button for ground floor, door closes, and the woman just freezes, moves to the back corner of the lift, clutches her purse, and is shaking. Um, completely terrified and asks me with his really shaky voice, who are you, what are you doing here? Um, and it occurs to me, a couple of floors down, that she was terrified for her life that I, a big black person, was going to rob her. And it also occurs to me with, with devastating clarity that she did not think that someone who looks like me would have any legitimate graduate student reason to be in an elevator in that building at that time of night. That is a horrible realization to come into on the first week of what ended up being a seven-year graduate program. And in important ways, it it's part of the reason it took me seven years to finish that program, because it was very clear from the beginning that I did not belong, that I did not look, I was not instinctively the kind of person that was expected to belong in a space like that. I share this story because beyond policies, beyond what we write in pap on papers, some of the most important conversations we need to have around how we attract and retain early career talent is how we create a sense of belonging, how we ensure that young people entering into this field, fields feel that they belong, feel that they have a fighting chance to even return the next day. Now, it turns out that this particular professor ended up teaching a course on, international, on feminist international relations. <coughs> um, I tried taking the class. I could not succeed in it, even though my concentration was on international relations. Um, the second story I wanted to share was of that same week, a different professor who and I don't know if um, this, I think many departments do this, have an opening picnic for the beginning of the school year where the new graduate students are introduced. And even before my turn was up to be introduced as a new student in the department, um, this woman ran towards me across the picnic field. Wanjiro, you're here. I'm so happy you're here. And the, and, and, I was surprised, how do you know who I am? And she said, I have been on the selection committee of the new graduate students, I read your profile, I'm so excited you're here. And the sense of belonging, the sense of, ooh, this is gonna be hard, that I'm gonna, but I'm gonna do this, was incredible. Again, two stories, two experiences, both in the first week, both with completely different impacts. And I had to make a decision along the way about which story I was going to keep playing over and over in the back of my head. And so my question and my challenge to you is, I, how are you moving through these spaces in a way that doesn't force early career scientists to have to pick not your story, not what you did to them, but what somebody else did to them? How are you navigating these spaces so that these early career scientists get to pick your voice as the voice in the back of their heads when they need to go through something incredibly difficult 
when they need to take their oral exams, how do you navigate, how do you show up so that it is your voice in the back of their heads encouraging them to keep going? Because much as we can design beautiful programs, and award is a beautiful, well-designed programs, it is the human interactions. It is the day-to-day -day ways and places that we meet each other as human beings that inform and shape and structure decisions to stay or leave, decisions to remain or to walk away for early career scientists. There's no way to design impactful programs if we're gonna be mean to each other. Um, and I don't know how to show you a graph that would represent that. So I'm just gonna, sharing my personal story and my personal experiences is the best way that I know how to do that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here.